when you're when you're in the the writers' room, I mean, do you did you have a particular strength? Were you did did they come to you for certain types of things? On the television shows, I don't think you know. I wasn't like particularly like a joke meister. You know, I wasn't my you know I'd done it a bit, but I think I could be funny sometimes. Um, I think if I had any strength, and I'm not even sure I did, it would be looking at the script as a whole and going, you know what, I think if we just shift it like this and come in from this angle, all these other things will fall away as problems and we just got to focus on, we can focus on this and this and maybe add this. And I've been told I have a lot of weird ideas. Um, they don't seem weird to me. But of course not. <laughs> <laughs> no, they really, and even, even when I do it in movies too, it's like people are always like, Okay, Ed, or, or hey, Ed, or, you know, on the positive side, it's, Ed, can you, can you bring in some of that stuff that, you know... And, some of that wild Solomania. Yeah, yeah Solomania. I never heard that, but, yeah, <laughs> that's what we're going to... I'm going to call it around our house yeah, from now on. Feel free to, yeah. to run with that one. I'm going to take it. Solomania. Yeah. Kids, it's Solomania time. <laughs> oh, no, Daddy, not again, <laughs> please. Um, but also, I think, you know, I am constantly battling with this demon within myself, which is my tendency to want to go weirder and weirder and weirder, because it seems normal to me in a story. I will, I will outline a story and get bored with this, what seems to be the kind of pedestrian outline, and just start tweaking it and tweaking it until I get myself into a place where the story is too weird and it makes no sense to anybody, and, and it's lost its grounding, you know? But, right. You actually got me, it's funny that we're doing this today, because you got me on a day where I, I actually am thinking, why am I speaking on this side? I should not be talking about screenwriting, because I don't know what the hell I'm doing right now. Well, but you, you can acknowledge that you've been successful at it from, a, from the standpoint that you've had your pictures produced, you've been hired many times, many of your films have done well. And I'm only no, saying... Not that those are the only no, ways I understand. to measure success. No, I, I only said that so that I could hear you say that. And I appreciate oh, that. Man, so, you got me. I got you. But the bait. Thank you. I'm gonna, the, Very well done. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you for, for taking the bait and running uh, with it. Let yeah, me ask no. this. When you, when you, after you watch a sh you know, the show's run, did you have some kind of either personal review process to find out what worked and what didn't? Or and the movies around that the table? Written? No, no, no. For, for like when you were doing It's Gary Shandling's show. Oh. Or Laverne and Shirley. Like, do you, was there any process for coming back and, and saying, you know, this, this, these kinds of storylines aren't working or... We need to go this way more with the dialogue, or? Well, there was a general sense. On Laverne and Shirley, they were, we were cranking them out so fast that I don't, by the time we could look at one, I mean, we were already six episodes down the line, and they were on their last season anyway, so, you know, it didn't really matter. On its Gary Shandling show, it was different because we were inventing the show as we were going along, and nobody was really watching the show very much, and we never got notes from anyone ever on that show, which was a great thing. And because of that, it was all up to us, but we had an intuitive sense of what, what was working and what wasn't working, and it became clear why shows that were working were working and why the ones that weren't working weren't working. And the reason was that show messed with the fourth wall. In that show, Gary Shandling played a guy who had a television show which shot out of his house called It's Gary Shandling Show. And it was an interesting concept. It was Gary's idea. You know, Gary and Alan Zweibel wrote the, created the show. Because of that, there was a lot of a desire to mess with the, the reality of the show because it was built within the concept of the show. But whenever we tried to tell a story that started with the physics of the show and didn't start with the characters in the show, it always was bad. Oh, interesting. And whenever we started with what's the truth of the moment and we built out from there, all the gimmicks would come. It's, always easier to come up with clever stuff than it is to come up with true stuff. True, true meaning being defined as true within the rules of this particular thing you're working on. It's the same with writing movies. It's easy to come up with like the clever way out of this or the, you know, the witty thing to do here or the cool idea that no one's ever seen before to do this. What's really hard is just going, okay, what would really happen here? Or, what does this character really want in this moment? Or why does this other person really not want them to do this? The most basic things are the hardest and the most important, and they should be the easiest. And today, I wouldn't say I'm literally banging my head against the wall, but 
almost, you know? <laughs> I've been working a long time on something. I've outlined it like crazy. I've written it. I've abandoned the outline and, you know, re-outlined it. I've finished it. I'm looking at it. And I'm realizing I lost track of some of the most basic things in the middle. I got so enamored with some of these wild ideas that I'd had that I, the whole, it's irrelevant. The whole piece falls apart at a certain point. And what I have to do is I have to go back to the very basics. Just literally, what is the truth of this moment? You know, screenwriting one or whatever it would be, you know, um, those basic rules. What does the character want? You know, what's, what's the objective? What's the obstacle? You know, things that you, you kind of abandon because you think you're, you know, oh, I don't need all that stuff, you know? Well, it's not, maybe not as exciting in the moment as like, what, what, what's the cool sequence here? What, what's the cool yeah. thing I can have the character say? Yeah. Right? But it's a dance between that, you know? It's, it's, okay, what's the truth? What's the simplest way to do this? Now, is, what's the most interesting way to do this? What's never been done before? But most important is, what's the cleanest way? What's the simplest way? You know, the least show-offy, the, the most honest. Usually those are the best ways to, to tell something, you know. At the end of the day, it, it's all about, you know, just what happens, I guess, you know. Do you feel like you improved during that period? Did, were there concrete things that you got better at? And would you recommend coming through TV to a prospective writer? I think it is always hard anyone to switch from joke writing to television, from television to film writing, from film writing to television writing. You know, it's hard from playwriting to film writing, film writing to playwriting. It's hard to switch from any of those unless two things. One, you love the genre into which you're switching. And two, you're willing to understand that they're different forms of expression that have similarities so that you don't say, well, I do this, and you apply it to that. They're very different. To be good at one does not translate into being good at another. But it's the same with anything, just like going, actually, I would even say the same applies between projects within the same medium, you know? What's good in this movie is not necessarily gonna be good in this movie. Right. Because I outline this script, you know, beat by beat by beat, this script maybe only wants this much outline and then it wants to really be discovered and then it wants to be outlined here. You know, it's, it's always different and I think part of the amazing mystery of it all is isolating what it is that makes this one special. What is it, it at its essence? What is this thing really about? And then how do you allow it to evolve organically? So it's the best version of whatever it is. Specifically regarding television and movies, I mean, TV, especially TV comedy writing, is a different game, you know. First of all, the screen's smaller. So you're, I mean, you, you laugh, but the truth is you're writing for people who are going to, the viewing experience is going to be entirely different. Right, now I see what you're saying. You know, so that's why it's shot in close-ups, you know. There's, you know, sweeping vistas are irrelevant in, you know, in television. Now, things are changing now that people are watching movies more at home, et cetera, et cetera. But different things work in those, you know. You can go more joke to joke to joke to joke, but in a movie, it rarely works that way. You know, the, the movie experience, the cinema watching experience is very different. Dialogue is less important. Television dialogue is really important. That's the sort of the main thing you're, you're That's getting. That's why you write almost no action in a TV script. I mean, it's a lot of yeah. A lot of white space on the page. Yeah. It's just because it's a different experience. The viewing experience is different. Do you read a lot of screenplays? I do not read a lot of screenplays. I should read good screenplays more. The problem is, and this is a problem for almost all student writers that I come across, and I taught a little bit at UCLA and um, in the film school, and I, I had this real beef you know, with the, the writers in the, in the program, which is, I think it's important probably to read some really good screenwriters. Yeah. But I would expand that. I think it's important to read good books. And I mean, it's important to read a lot, but not just screenwriting. I don't think reading screenplays is gonna help you as much as just reading, period. You know, knowing what's possible um, in the human imagination. You know, what is, 
knowing what other people have thought of, knowing what stories precede you, knowing what you know other writers are doing with things, just reading for fun and, and reading you know because you're professionally interested. But the problem with student film schools and stuff like that is people read other people's work constantly and give criticism and notes and talk about it. And what happens is they really don't understand what great writing really is. They know what good student writing is and they limit their um, perspective of what, what's out there and what's possible within themselves, you know. I do think it's important to have a group of people around you who can challenge you and push you because like a lot of great writers and artists and actors and comedians come out of groups and stuff. It's important, but I think you have to be really careful how you use it, I guess. You know? So there aren't any you can, you can think of that you read that you thought were really good scripts? I mean, produced that might be available to, to someone? I, you know, look, I have two kids. <laughs> it's really hard for me to find time to do anything other than write during the day and then, you know, be home at night. And like, I just don't have time to read a lot of scripts, you yeah. know? No, I've not really read a lot of great scripts. Was there a moment when you, when you, that you reached where you felt, I can really do this? There's never been a moment that I've reached where I thought, I can really do this. There never has been. But I did notice a change earlier this year on Tokyo Sucker Punch, which, if I can pull it off, I think could be a really cool movie if I can get the script to really work. But it's really complicated. And during the process, at any number of times, had I been writing this on spec or had I been writing this years ago, I would have probably given up. Because there's nothing that exists that's like it, so there's nothing I could rely on other than my own imagination of what this movie could be. And it's been really hard. But the thing that's different is, in the back of my mind, I do have faith that I'll figure it out. I don't feel like I know how to answer it. I don't feel like I know what the answer is to this movie or I'll just do my little this or that to it, you know? But in the back of my mind, I know I'll keep working on it until I get it right. So to me, that's different than I used to feel, which is just, you know, maybe like, oh, I can't, I'll never figure this out and just give up, you know? I well, know- Well, clearly you didn't give up. I mean, you, you turned in your assignments, you got- uh... Yeah, no, I mean, I've, I mean, look, you know, here's another change for, for me. When I first started out, you know, I think I got very successful very young. And I think I, both in TV, I mean, we're talking about Laverne and Shirley, it makes me feel like such an old man, but I was, you know, 21 years old. I didn't really know what I was doing, nor did I know how lucky I was. Right. I was, I felt like, oh my God, I'm, lu I'm lucky, but I didn't really on a deeper level realize how, how fortunate I was. And similarly, when Chris and I got Bill and Ted set up, you know, we were young. I was like 24 years old, you know? Because of that, I think, I don't think I ever realized how genuinely fortunate I am to be able to work, you know, and to work doing something that I like to do. And so now, every time I get a job, I'm just, I'm grateful for it. I realize that I am lucky because there's a lot of people who are easily as talented as I am who are not working for whatever reason, you know? So I know that whatever I'm doing, to keep myself employed, um, many jokes come to mind, but I'll keep away from that. Uh, whatever I'm doing, you know, I'm appreciative of that. But I'm also very aware of the fact that the industry is changing, the industry is going to continue to change, so, and I have no control over that. Also, I'm changing. So I need to make sure that for my own writing, that as I change, that my writing changes so that it's still vital and relevant and, you know, worth people spending money on, not as me as a, to me as a screenwriter, but like to make a movie on or to go see, pay money to go see in a theater or on your iPod or whatever you're going to watch a movie on now, you know. So I got to keep myself, you know, in the game in that way. Right. I mean, it's the sort of equivalent of keeping your, if you're manufacturing, just keeping your factory, you know, up to speed, I Open. guess. It's got to be making is. something, right. Yeah. Well, I want to I break down the specifics of uh, a sequence that you chose 
uh, from Levity okay. as, as a favorite of yours, something you thought was pretty effective. And it's, it's kind of the linchpin of the, the movie because it, it, uh, it's a scene where Manuel Jordan, uh, played by Billy Bob Thornton, tells Sophia the story, finally, we as viewers uh, hear the story of what he did. Obviously, we're building to this point where we have to hear what, what Manuel actually did. Right. So how, how and why and when did it That's come a good, to you? It's a good question. Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember whether it always stayed in the same place. I do know that with levity, I never, I didn't really outline it in terms of acts, so I didn't know first act, second act, third act. What I, I knew I wanted to have that come out. I also knew exactly how I wanted to shoot that sequence. And the reason I was thinking about that as something for you to show here was, it's the closest in the movie to how I imagined it to be from when I wrote it. Well, it's very, it's got it cross cuts, you know, we see, him telling the story, we see, we go with the audio crosses over at times. Yeah, the uh, specifics of that, the, the, audi the audio edit um, was something that um, the editor brought in, brought in in terms of the specifics of the voice. But in terms of the video and the different, it's, it's, it's a subjective point of view, but, but we shot it from a lot of different angles because I, I thought that his memory wouldn't be Exactly. You know, as he keeps revisiting it in his memory, sometimes he'd see it from up here and sometimes from down here and sometimes from just here. Interesting. Um, but I knew that I wanted it to be, to come out at a place uh, within the two, his relationship with Sophia where he felt, um, you know, safe to, to talk about it. And I also knew that he wouldn't talk about it to the person who he really wants to talk about it to, which is the sister of the boy he killed, whose name is Adele, played by Holly Hunter. And it felt like the place in the movie where, you know, it was time to sort of let the next level of the movie start to happen. Okay. So you always had him telling Sophia? Did you ever have him maybe telling Miles or? I remember, I believe I did always have him telling Sophia, I, I think. You know, I, um, I, my first attempt at this movie um, was entirely his relationship with this with Sophia, this girl Sophia, oh, really? and okay. this character of Miles that Morgan Freeman played, and I actually wrote it hoping Morgan Freeman would play that part. No kidding. Oh. Yeah, it's funny. He was the he's the only one that too that I sort of did did it that way for, and then I I remember having dinner with a friend of mine who's a screenwriter named Scott Frank, who's, a, I think, a really great... This guy's great. Yeah, he's a great screenwriter. He did uh, Out of Sight. Uh, you know, a bunch of movies. He's written a ton of... You know, he's a really good writer. Um, in fact, it's funny. I, I was cleaning out my office a few weeks ago at home, my like, home office, and I, I came upon this like, big, huge hunkin' script without a title, and I was like... Where did I get this? And I open it, it's like, who sent me a 170 page screenplay? Ugh, like what loser is what I was thinking, you know? <laughs> right. What like lame, you know, person that I met in a taxi cab, you know, like said, oh, you're a writer, let me give you, you know, like yeah. who, and why did I agree to take it? And did I ever read it? And I opened it, because it wasn't titled, I didn't know what it was. And I, I opened it to the middle, like page 85, which was the middle. Um, I actually told Scott this recently, and I was like, I started to read it, and like right away, I was like, this is good writing. What is this? You know, and I was drawn in right away. Anyway, it was Scott's original draft of Out oh, of Sight. You, oh, I thought you were going to say you wrote your name on the front. And I wrote my name and, in. and turned it in. I actually, <laughs> cut it in half and turned it in for two different scripts. Oh, right. Yeah, it was great. Um, no, I, um, I, but I could tell right away that he was in control of his craft. You know, he, it was engaging. I had a sense of who the characters were without having read the first 85 pages, just in the way they spoke. His wow. ear, I thought, was so strong. Anyway, it turned out to be, he had given, and I remember, oh, right, right, he had given like this big rough draft, and, we, and I gave him some notes. Anyway, I had had dinner with Scott Frank, uh, this was a long time ago, and I was telling him the, the story of levity that I was trying to write at the time, and he said, it sounds to me like the strength of your movie, the real drama, is in with the sister, and that opened up a whole thing for me. Oh, yeah, you're right. I want to have that become more of a thing. So when I, I sat down to rewrite it and it became a movie more balanced between um, this, this girl, this waitress that he's, or she was a waitress at one point, now she, she worked at the community center or was a kid at the community center. I mean, right. Anyway, the point of that was, I don't know. The point of that was something. The point of that is I know Scott Frank. Oh, that was yeah. the point. Name dropping. Yeah. yeah. 
Did the dialogue and the way it play out, played out that sequence change a lot uh, during revisions? Did you revise that a lot? That or sequence... Or change the order? Or? I, I, the, the, the beginning of the sequence where he says, mostly I, I remember images, um, I, has always been in there. Is that um, something you heard in one of your interviews, or did you...? What I got from talking to the kid who actually, um, I, in a way, was the inspiration for the story, the kid with the photograph, was that he didn't remember the specifics of what happened. F for the kid in, who did it, he, he, sh he shot someone that he didn't really know. Um, and he couldn't explain why he did it, which I thought was really interesting. He was guilty of doing it, and couldn't exp but there was no reason. Because of that, too, the central character in, in Levity is, is just, you know, he has nothing to land on when he keeps revisiting this moment. Why did I do it? I don't know why. I had written it mostly um, as it was performed, but Billy Bob added a couple of things. Mm. He added my favorite line, just off the top of his head while, while filming it, where he says about it, it taking, you know, taking forever. The thing about that sequence, that um, one of the reasons that I thought it, it was interesting for me is that it's one of the few sequences in the movie that's almost exactly as I imagined it would be, right. from the page to the screen. A lot of other things in the movie changed a lot. The movie is shot in Montreal in the snow. I had initially written it to be shot in the spring, uh, full of people, you know, uh, that Manuel Jordan, Billy Bob's character, who plays a guy, and Billy Bob plays a guy who doesn't want to be in the world, thinks he doesn't belong in the world, um, and is forced out in the world, and then enters into a world dense with people, just right. yeah, in the no, middle of, you know, life. Um, but because we had so little money, and we had to shoot in Montreal, and we had to shoot in the dead of winter, I had to completely rethink the, f the film, visually. Um, we couldn't afford extras. And it would be literally a crowd, which then would be, do you mind if it's a dozen people, which then was, what if it's four people, which then became one woman, like, in a window, you know, or something. <laughs> Literally wow. no money, you know, to, to, to afford people to be standing around at night, you know, in the snow in this movie. So we did have to make a lot of creative changes, you know, uh, just to get the movie made. And, um, you know, sometimes I wonder if, if being so desperate to get the movie made, if, if I made too many, you know, that's, that's too something. Too many sacrifices. So, yeah, to, yeah, should I have held on to it and, you know, made it when I, the time was right. But it was an amazing experience making that movie. I learned a lot about writing just from the editing process. Really? What did, what did you pick up from that? You realize how little really needs to be said. I thought I was learning that just from having movies produced. You know, I wrote a big, long, beautiful paragraph, I thought, in uh, Men in Black, where Tommy Lee Jones is explaining something to Will Smith. I mean, I probably, I bet you I spent a week, you know, total rewrite, you know, on, on all the time. It just ended up being Tommy Lee Jones looking at Will Smith, you know, and then moving on. <laughs> and you know, it's way better than had I, he done that whole big long speech. It, it's almost never the case that your big long thing is better than a quick, easy, simple way to tell the same thing. Well, it's interesting, in the sequence in, in Levity, it seems like a long speech, but it's not really. I mean, it, with all the cross cuts and everything, it's actually pretty... It's, yeah, it's about that long, you know. Yeah. There's so much that you hear when you're writing, and it really fills out your page, and you write it, and it all feels really necessary. Then when you see it up on screen, you realize how little of the dialogue is actually necessary. If you go to a movie, and you bring a typewriter, or you bring a, um, a recorder, and you record it and go back and transcribe it, the dialogue is usually very sparse. There's much less needed to actually convey what they're trying to convey. Part of that, unfortunately, um, is the process of putting something up on film. So I say unfortunately because when you read a screenplay, sometimes you do actually need those extra lines of dialogue. Right. Um, however, uh, that's just part of the process of making a movie. But one of the things that I learned about editing wasn't so much about editing screenplays, but I learned at the end of the day, 
you actually know the answer. It's not as far away as you might think it is. In other words, all that crazy stuff you think about, you know, well, I think I need this because of this. And da, 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 da. Truthfully, you know. What do you really think? Truthfully, I don't need it. I don't need it.